Podcast City Network. Thank you for tuning in on this episode of the Everett Lee Show. But before we get on with the guest onto the program today, there's a couple things I do want to mention that you can help out with supporting the Everett Lee Show. If you're looking to start a podcast and already have a podcast and you're looking for an affordable podcasting hosting site, Podbeam's your number one choice. Podbeam offers statistics with in-depth analytics to manage your podcast needs. Use the promo code podbeam.com slash PB sign up and get a free month off. That's podbeam.com slash PB sign up to get a free month off and see why 1,500 episodes have been shared all over the world in the past 11 years with over 3,000 subscribers that have chose Podbeam as their number one hosting site. And if you're looking to get into advertising, Podbeam advertising, you'll get $100 off advertising when you sign up as a sponsorship over on podbeam.com slash pro slash PB sign up. That's podbeam.com slash pro slash PB sign up. You're listening to the Everett Lee Show. What's happening, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Everett Lee Show. I'm the Everett Lee. Hope everyone's enjoying their Labor Day weekend. I certainly am. Going over material and getting ready to release a couple new episodes for this week here in the next couple weeks. And this is one of the new episodes. I know the previous week I didn't release an episode with a lot of things and projects going on at the moment, but this is one of the new episodes. This was taken from a recent episode of ELS Uncut. Ripper Blackheart and myself had the pleasure to talk with film producer, director, Thomas Ryan of the Theater of Terror. Thomas Ryan's been on the podcast as many times as the horror nerd Todd Sturuch of the Imaginarium. And a shout out to Todd Sturuch, who's helping behind the scenes with Thomas Ryan with the Theater of Terror. This conversation that I had in Ripper Blackheart with Thomas Ryan, we discussed a preview that we had the pleasure of viewing was The Sooth Slayer. One of the new episodes that's going to be in the Return to Theater of Terror anthology, which is just great. And I cannot wait for to see what the other films will look like when they get finished. We discussed the return to theater to terror and the progress and where it's at at that time. Also, we discuss my experience watching the first run of the theater of terror. And conversation's good. We get into that. We take some Q&A from the live audience that was watching in on the live stream of ELS Uncut. Great conversation, great interview, as always. I love having Thomas Ryan on. I love discussing films with him and just, in general, any other conversation that comes to mind. But without further ado, here is the conversation with myself and Ripper Blackheart from ELS Uncut. Recent episode here with film director, film producer Thomas Ryan. Enjoy. Back on the program tonight, none other than film director and producer of Theater of Terror, Thomas Ryan. What's up, man? Hey, guys. How are you? Good. Good. Good, Good, man. How'd you like Soothsayer? Dude, that was great. Ripper and I enjoyed it. I mean... What, what, I want to get Ripper's thoughts on this, man. I send it to him, and <laughs> oh, it was very Twilight Zoney. Uh, what's what's Outer Limits type feel to it, and I like that. I I love the fact that it was all shot in black and white. Cool. It, it gave it it gave a whole new element to it. I, I don't think it would have the same effect if it was in color. I think if no. it's in black and white and. The simplicity is there's no more than three actors in it. Right. And it still told a great story. And it, didn't get, it wasn't real complex with the, the science of it, which is great. It reminded me of the stuff from the 60s where, you know, 
They don't know how this shit happens. They just want to tell a story about it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, really, I, I did. I really dug it. Uh, like I said, and I think there's a huge market for that. You know, people like that type of stuff, the, the, the Twilight Zone and stuff yeah. like that, the, those kind of strange tales, amazing, like amazing stories back in the right, day. Right, right. You know, stuff like that. So, Heck yeah. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was very good. Yeah, it's it it was it was great, man. That's that's what I was discussing with Ripper there, to, Tom. It was like almost like watching an episode of Twilight Zone, but it was so good. I mean, just shot in black and white, which I loved. The only color was the vial and just the story of it. And I I loved the story behind it because Time travel don't really work out the way you think it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another thing. The twist. I knew as soon as I seen it, there's going to be a twist. What's the twist going to be? And then when it happened, you was like, ah, son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so just so the audience knows what we're talking about, we just kind of shot into it. Soothsayer is going to be the first act of the new... Return to the Theater of Terror anthology, um, and that's actually going to be the opening film for it. Um, you guys got to see it, as well as um, our donors uh, for our Indiegogo campaign. Anybody at the Terror Trooper level and above has gotten a screener of it, so uh, it's been getting really good. I've been getting a lot of good feedback on it. I'm, I'm glad you guys liked it. I'm glad you um, enjoyed the, you know, I mean, it is like an homage to, to Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits, and even like the old Universal Monster movies with the castle and the fog around the castle, like we love that. You know, that was something big that we were going for. We wanted that look. Um, our like, lead. Mad, like mad scientist. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the lead, Anthony Robert Grasso. Uh, the, the other lead, Dennis uh, Wee and Samantha. The third lead, they were, I mean, we had three leads basically, but um, I thought they were excellent. I thought they really um, captured uh, the performance of something that w might might have been written in the 1960s, or or that kind of acting style, which uh, which was something that we really emphasized that we were looking for. So that was cool. Yeah, I'm glad I, you guys like that too. Yeah. Oh, I, I I loved it, man. Like like Ripper said there. Yeah, like the like the the house and stuff. Was that was that that was all shot in uh, uh, New Jersey there, right where you live? Correct. Shot in New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. So the two locations we used. One was Kipps Castle. That's in Verona, New Jersey. Um, beautiful, beautiful uh, castle. Um, and then we also shot in the Bloomfield College in Bloomfield, New Jersey, which uh, was great. And the college was wonderful working with us and allowing us to go in there and use those interiors. The exteriors of that college uh, are beautiful as well, but uh, unfortunately we only required the interiors because we also had the castle, so those exteriors worked great. Nice, nice. Yeah. I, I did, it did have, like Ripper said there, that 60s feel for it, and especially when when the car drove up the, the old SS, the Chevy there, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. man, I love that. That's my favorite car from Chevy right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's great. That car was actually lent to us by uh, the Bloomfield Cruisers, um, and they're like a, they do classic car shows in Bloomfield, and uh, it's very cool stuff. But, but uh, I reached out to them because I knew they'd have a car. I've been to the car shows before, hung out. You know, it's a great family event. It usually takes place on Wednesday nights. I know COVID is throwing the the, uh, the schedule off a bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were great though. They were great. I I, I re re reached out to them and um, they provided us with a great vehicle, which just made the uh, made more for the um, the um, oh yeah on the piece that that we were trying to do the period piece. I, said, I I love when someone does retro and they don't make it cheesy. Yeah, you know yeah, I and mean? uh, that that like when someone does an homage to a crappy movie. Yeah. Now there's just two crappy movies, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll, yeah, no, I agree. And that was it. That was actually something that we were definitely wanted to avoid when we made this. I didn't want to make it like tongue in cheek. I didn't want to make it like you know a parody. I just wanted to make it feel like a serious, dramatic Twilight Zone episode. And um, I think that's what you know we got out of it. Yeah. If you don't know yeah. anybody, think this is something from the '60s. Yeah. Right. 
Like, right. had I not known any better, if I would just cruise along the internet or Amazon, what have you, and this came up and there was no, like, what year it was released or any of that, you would think that, yeah, this this must have been some kind of show that was out in the 60s. That's and great. It just didn't take off like the other like the other ones. Right, right. Uh, that's great. No, that's perfect. Yeah, it 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 was it it felt and it captured that right there because I know we talked before when you've been on here on the program before talked about theater terror with having that like Twilight Zone outer limits feel to it and it definitely felt like that and I loved how with the with the way you approach time travel instead of physical being it's like ask you know. Uh, the projectile, the person there, and they see what happens. But don't want to give too much away, man. But right, right. Wow. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I loved it. I That's loved cool. It. Thank you. I thought that through a lot because just in a story in and of itself, time travel is a very tough topic to, 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 uh, to tackle. And you know, something that I always hear from friends, I, I myself express her. Whenever you walk out of a time travel movie, you go, "Well, why didn't they just?" Or how come yeah. this? And the, I, you know, I don't like the fact that this doesn't work this way. And so there's always those. Uh, it's very hard to find a perfect time travel movie. I, I always enjoyed the H.G. Wells stuff. Yes. Um, you know, the time machine is great, and yes. uh, you know, I mean, Back to the Future is great, and all that stuff is great. Like we love those movies. I try to suspend all disbelief. But when we were creating this, when I was writing the script, that was something that was definitely on my mind i said i don't want to make this so complex where it kind of ruins the story for people because they're overthinking the science um i i i did want that sense of camp from a 1960s film where like you were saying ripper like you just kind of go okay let's i'm in yeah. let's go i believe you well now what <laughs> you know and so that's kind of what we were trying to do with that and at the same time um something that i do talk about is that time l limits do uh, time travel does have its limits in this story so it's not you're just like, hey, here's a key, and you can go anywhere that you want in time. There's more restrictions on it, which helped me to design the story in a certain way that um, they benefited one. The restrictions benefited the story and vice versa, you know, where it just kind of worked together. And, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was something I did to avoid that complexity and the debate that you fall into with a time travel story that just tries to be too smart, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, but it's a different take on time travel. Like, mm -hmm. like ever said, it wasn't the classic. You know, you're going into time, and right? You're physically there, doing whatever, running right, around. Right, right. It was, you know, and it, I, and it's believable because you know, we don't well, like, I, we don't know, and not only that is. That's probably more plausible than actual physical time travel. Well, but yeah, yeah and that, that concept to me almost... I wanted to do something that really came off as what the first version of time travel might be. Yeah. yeah. You know, not, not this machine that like works like you said, where you're just stepping in. Like I wanted to, you know, through some doorway, I wanted to make it almost seem like, hey, this is kind of like what the first... You know, maybe maybe in another fifty years they'll devise something that's really cool and futuristic. But this is supposed to be again, like a DeLorean. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> well, we won't get one of those until nineteen eighty four. But there you, you know. go, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, I love I love these. Doc Brown watched an episode of Theater of Terror. <laughs> 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 I, I love the special effects. The special effects that was used in this to where when it showed a person going into time and how that was done, that was, yeah. that was great. And just like the astro projectile stuff and everything was just fantastic. I love this take Thank on you. it. And, yeah, Thank you. And not and, over the top, not cheesy. Very fitting for the story you wanted to tell. I, yeah, I, I, yes. I, I liked it too. It's like, yeah, you didn't you didn't get crazy with it. It fit no. in with what you were doing. Right. Uh, that that's another thing I, I liked about it. Yeah. Yeah, we, and 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 something that I really wanted to do with those visual effects is even as important as they are to the story. I didn't want them to seem um, um, more contemporary than than the film is i wanted it to look like something that 
what kind of effects would they be able to do back then? Um, and to a certain degree, I believe that we kind of, you know, we kind of fit that mold. Like, okay, I don't want to go above this. Like, I don't want to have crazy CGI and, yeah. you know, I just kind of want to simplify it. And, and so how can we make it look like it's of that period too? It was really important to keep everything, like I said, looking very period centric and, um, because the story was written that way, the characters are written that way. Um, we wanted to look that way with the, and we wanted it to go beyond just the black and white. We needed the locations, we needed the car, we needed the suits, we needed the, the, the clothing, the wardrobe. Um, Samantha provided uh, all of her own wardrobe, um, which is some of her stuff is amazing. You know, in the film when you see it, it's just it's just great. So all those little things played a big part in just ma making the story easy to watch and follow without questioning anything about it. And so th that's we didn't want to snatch the viewer out of the film with some crazy special effects, but just <laughs> something that looked, you know, something that looked really plausible. Yeah. Yeah, they, it it was like Ripper said, pretty simple straight to the point and pretty much it told a really good story there. Another another good story that Ripper got to watch was Faces. He he sat uh -huh. down and watched Faces this weekend. I told him I told him about Faces because it's one of my favorite movies that you did. Thanks, and man. and uh, you're welcome. And he he watched it and uh, he. <laughs> what do you think about a Ripper? <laughs> All I gotta say, you know, Charlie had it coming. That dude was a dick. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> he did. He did. It's like he even. Uh, I don't like again. I don't want to give a lot away, but even if Frank wasn't off his meds, Frank would have been totally justified in the murder in that guy. Right, right, <laughs> right. I mean, Ripper, did you not like the part where he's sitting there, he's talking, you know, along, you know, with with everything on the wall there, the faces. Yeah. <laughs> that was well, great. I, the I told ever. I said, I told him. I'm not going to lie. I was going into it with a little dread. Just because when you hear independent film on Amazon, yeah, you never well, know what you're going to get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, Faces is funny. Faces is a film that I love. We shot in Jersey City. So many of my hometown friends were involved in the making of that film. And we got it on Amazon, and we got a lot of really good reviews for it when it went on Amazon or initially, and then later on, like, the bad reviews caught up with us. And what a lot of people were complaining about was the sound, which is legit. I mean, look, the sound is it's poor quality. We didn't, In the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah, it's, but, we got uh, really lucky with the way it came out, considering that we basically recorded everything with an onboard mic. We had no booms or anything like that. We were, we were walking around with a Canon... A, a Canon T5 or something like that, and 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 an onboard mic. So, it it, it wasn't anything. Um, no no high tech gear, um, but that's probably my only regret for that for that movie. But the fact that we pulled it off, and uh, it's pretty twisted flick. You know, I really think it it's kind of cool, and um, I I love it still. I I love it. I'm glad you saw it, Ripper. And uh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm. I'm open to watching all kinds of stuff. Like I said, you don't know what you're going to get. Like I said, I've seen some stuff that looks like they just some high schoolers with a camcorder. Yeah, and they, sure. They, they got sure. some kind of free program on their computer, put right. stuff together, and I don't know how it makes its way to Amazon, right. but it's on there. And there'll be times I'll just go down a rabbit hole, and I don't even know it. I mean, just by the trailer alone. To me, a trailer should make you want to watch a movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and there's a trailer. You're like, this trailer just makes me want to just find who made this and punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but there are times I'll be, I'm like, ah, screw it. How bad could it be? You yeah. watch it, you're like, oh, that's pretty bad. And then you go down below, and like they're also watched. Right. Who watched this? Let's see. <laughs> I want to see what else they're watching. Then again, you get, yeah. you do get some. Like I said. Faces was better than a lot of stuff that I've seen. A lot of stuff. That I've seen. <laughs> good. It was it was shot it was shot really good and it was I liked how it was cut. I loved the makeup and the effects for it. I remember when after I watched it, I I mentioned this to you. I don't even think I've mentioned this to you since then. After I watched it, was the part where you hit the table. I mean, you. I mean, you like hit the damn table. I'm like, oh yeah. shit, man. He hit yeah. table, and you're like, oh man, it was it was you. 
you know, you explained it to me. I was like, okay, that makes much yeah. more sense. But yeah, wow, doing your own stunts now. I was when I was watching. That's that. it. You know, stuntmen <laughs> are expensive these days, man. Yeah, <laughs> insurance and stuff involved. No, but I love doing stunts. Um, you know, obviously uh, that was something that you know I what I could refresh your memory. What we basically did is um, for Tom Tommy the land, who played Jose the landlord. He kind of like lifts me in the air and slims me on the table. So we wanted to get that that vertical lift on it and that height. So r- right next to the kitchen counter where you can't see, there was a stack of like five phone books. And so when he was pushing me backwards in the last step, I take my right leg and I prop it on the phone books and I jump up. And that's when he's lifting his arm up. And so I get the vertical. And then what we did with the table... It's a real wood table, but I basically unscrewed the legs of the table, and I had three of the legs uh, which were propping up the table straight, and then I had the fourth leg. Actually, I had the two table, the, the two uh, end uh, legs straight, and the two slightly on an angle on the outside, so that as soon as I hit it, they would collapse, and I didn't want to break the legs of the table, and we successfully we pulled it off. We didn't uh, damage the table, and uh, no tables were harmed in the making. No tables were harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> we did cut yeah, off a few you, heads, though. You need on the director's cut. That should be at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. got the got some questions in the chat here. David David Russell wants to ask uh, for you, Tom. How long do you release a trailer before it gets out to the public? And yes, David, Faces is out on Amazon Prime. But on that question there, um, how long do I uh, how long do I put out a trailer prior to the release of the film? Is that the way I'm understanding that? He how long how long do you release? a trailer before it gets out to the public. How long does do you so in, he, I guess I guess he means the film, right? Yeah, before I, the yeah, film is out. I'm, I'm, yeah. That's why I'm saying it. Okay. Yeah. Um I usually won't put together a trailer until the film is done. But I know people do like, you know, proof of concept type trailers or what have you. I don't I, I'll wait until I've got like all my best footage before I put a trailer together. And then I'll probably put a trailer together um, within, probably within three three weeks after the film is completely edited and finished. I'll try to get a trailer done by then. Um, I will put together teaser trailers uh, beforehand, but, you know, just that those aren't much uh, footage or anything like that. But No, but an official trailer... Probably three weeks after I've completely uh, com- finished the, the the feature or the short, whatever. Okay. And then how long do you release the actual film? So the film goes through a process where I'll do film festivals, um, I'll sell DVDs, I'll do the con scene, the convention scene for a while. Um, we'll do the film festival scene for a while. We might hold some private screenings or, or I mean, public screenings. We'll, we'll have a premiere for the film, like we did with the Theater of Terror, and where we shot it in that theater, we had the premiere there. Um, so we usually exhaust all those avenues first to try to make some revenue for the next set of films, and then um, then we'll try. Then at that point is when I'll shop around for a distribution deal, so I could let somebody else kind of handle the the marketing of you know nationwide level or on you know VOD or whatever. I'll let somebody else do that, and so that's the process that we've been approaching the the films with. Oh, nice, nice. And speaking speaking of faces, Frank, I he was in uh, he was mentioned briefly in uh, Theater of Terror. <laughs> Which which I which I did watch today. I was sitting there trying to figure out why I could not buy the damn thing on my Amazon Prime, and it coming out, I had to update my uh, credit card information. I'm like shit, so I updated. Hey, it. Come on, get uh, with it. Pay <laughs> well, your I, bills. I, I, well, <laughs> it's hard when you have kids, man. But I make do. I make do. But sure. I I got things straightened out. It took me about half the damn day trying to figure this out because all the card information. Finally got it straightened out, and uh, about five o'clock, five thirty day, I ordered ordered Theater of Terror, 
and I watched it. And the first two episode, the first two shorts, The Gift and Bookworm, yeah. creeped me the fuck out. <laughs> Good. Yes. Good. <laughs> and, and abducted and endangered. I really, really enjoyed. Uh, abducted. I was laughing at uh, a lot of a lot of the parts, especially when when Ned, whenever the um, when he had the visitor come in through the woods there, and all of a sudden it was like, yeah. <laughs> I just started laughing. It was like, yeah. just yeah. you know, the UFO coming in, and yeah. just yeah. all that, and yeah. And then endangered man, I was like, "Holy crap, man! You you let it loose on endangered." And I was laughing at the beginning, danger with uh, or with a good friend of ours, Todd Sturrich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting getting mauled down there at the beginning of the, the beginning Love of danger. Right. Yeah, and just I I I loved it, and it it left and the way you, I don't want to give too much away. The way you left it. It was like, wow, this is it, and uh, that's pretty, and then it just ends. And yeah, I don't give too much away. The man's trying to make some money. He's trying to make a living. <laughs> I'm not giving too much away, Rip. I'm not giving too much away. But the the gift and and bookworm, the gift that that right there was a pretty pretty good story there. I mean, just just that short story there with how that was done, and mostly just. All of Theater of Terror, the first one was shot right in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. All of it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah all of it was shot. We shot in Barnegat, which is more southern New Jersey. We shot in Barnegat. We shot in um, in Bloomfield. We shot in Glen Ridge. We shot in Belleville. We shot in Patterson. Um, yeah, um, Monroe, Monroeville, I think, or Monroe Township. Yeah. Maybe Monroeville. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we shot everywhere. Branchville, New Jersey, and Danger was in Branchville. So uh, yeah, we got around. That's that's great. I myself, I've never been to New Jersey, but my the first my self published comic I did back in the day, my main character, I put in Jersey City. There you go. Nice. And I, we we had these other guys from Jersey at a convention beside us, and they're like. Oh, that that's great! Jersey doesn't get no representation. Yeah, all. that's right. That's so true. is New York. It's true. <laughs> Faces were shot in Tommy Jersey. Yeah, so yeah, love I, it. I um just just watching just watching the theaters here. I was telling my wife about it. Check this out, Tom. I was telling I was telling my wife about it because after after Faces or not Faces after the Gift and Bookworm. After I walked out of the room, and she's like, "How's the movie?" And I said, "Dude, it's it's creepy." And she said, "What?" And I was explaining the gift, and she said, "No, no, no! I, dolls creep me out. Don't tell me about it." She took off in terror. I'm like, "Damn!" I was like, "It. That's this is why it got a really good high rating on the IMDb uh, page there, man, which I think yeah. is fantastic, and just the way." Each short was shot and cut was great. I mean, the gift with with the bookworm, I mean, with with the doll, the bookworm went about how I didn't expect it would be because I mean, just just the special effects on the on the uh, on the worm itself. I mean, who 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 was uh who created that and who was special the, who did the uh the stuff on the worm? Yeah, so the effects were created by Mike Scardello. Um, Mike's Mike's an effects artist in the indie community, been doing it a long time, worked on a lot of projects. I've worked with him before. Mike was on Faces with me. When I'm hacking the boss up and the blood is squirting in my face, that's actually Mike on the other end of a pump, like, squirt me. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, Mike's great. And um, he's actually working with us on this new anthology as well. Um, he, so his, his, his first job is coming up on Splinter, uh, which is the next short that we're working on for that one. But I was just actually with Mike today, and we were putting that, uh, that stuff together. But, yeah, Mike did the, the, the worms uh, for the bookworm, and it was great because I, I also sculpt as a hobby. So I made these little clay worms that were probably about this big, and I gave them, sent them to him, and I said, this is what I want the worms to look like. 
So he said, okay, great. And uh, he went to work with, uh, and Mike knows that we're like on a restricted budget. What's great is that he's so talented. He can make, you know, he can make some props out of some very inexpensive things. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll save the behind the scenes stories for another time. But yeah, he made those worms. We're on set. He shows up with a bucket of slime. Um, the worms were manipulated several ways. One was a puppet where we had our, our, our hands in it. Um, a couple were basically, we had kind of fishing line around them and moving them around and, and doing the kind of like off camera, you know, manipulation of them. So, uh, it was me, Mike, um, Todd, I believe did some puppet effects too. So we had a couple of guys there on set, uh, doing that, but yeah, that was Mike's creation. Um, we loved them. I particularly like the scene where the the worm is like slithering up Scott's eye. And yeah, oh. and, it's, and you see his, his eyelid going up, and uh, that you know not planned. It's creeping, just, it's creeping him out. Just you talking about yeah. it. Yeah, it is. It is it's Ripper. Like, you gotta see it, man. It he's is just creepy. Like kind of doing this in his chair. Yeah, uh, it's like it is creepy, man. Do you remember? All right, remember Creep Show, uh, Ripper Creep Show. Oh. Remember. Remember the episode with uh, Stephen King with the grass? Oh, yeah. It reminded me a little bit of that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what it reminded me of there. That that shit was just, it just was creepy, man. And I, I mean, the story behind each... What I loved about this was each character had a story behind it. Why they're at where they're at. And I do want to mention this right here. I want to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive more into the conversation right here. But first, there's a couple things I do want to mention. Since 1995, HighSpots.com has grown to be the company it is by serving the wrestling fans throughout the world with a great selection of merchandise. HighSpots.com has everything a wrestling fan could want, including the latest WWE and TNA releases, classic wrestling merchandise, and their HighSpots.com exclusive releases. HighSpots.com is the leading online retailer for professional wrestling and mixed martial arts offering autographs, figures, DVDs, apparel, wrestling gear, and even wrestling rings. Their largest clients include WWE, Impact Wrestling, ROH and AEW. Click on the High Spots logo on the Everett Lee Show page over on podcast.net to order. Whether you are a wrestling fan, pro wrestler, or promoter, you can find what you're looking for at highspots.com. If you grew up as a kid in the 1980s or just a fan of 1980s pop culture, then ADTs is for you. ADTs sells a huge variety of licensed t shirts featuring characters, movies, TV shows, video games, and music stars from the 1980s through today. They also have great costumes from 80s pulp culture too. ADTs.com sells officially licensed pulp culture t shirts. As you might guess, their focus is on the 1980s, but do sometimes sell other cool pop culture related tees. 80s tees has been in business since 2000, meaning they like retro 80s stuff too before it was cool. Follow the link provided in the description section of this episode for more. 80stees.com you're listening to The Everett Lee Show. I mean, Abducted had that twist with it, though. But the alien, was was he responsible for doing the alien? For the alien um, no, so the alien was a combination of... Um, uh, a company called RBFX actually manufactured that mask. Okay. I never realized, like, for such a popular type of a, a, a creature or character in our culture, aliens, it was really unbelievable to find a really good alien mask. It was it was almost impossible um, that not to get something that was really cheesy at looking. And so we found this one through RBFX, and then we went through a company called Superheroes Unlimited, um, that you could find on Facebook, and they made the bodysuit. Yeah, uh, I have them on my. Yeah, page. so they made the bodysuit like custom sized for our actor, who is the the alien and the werewolf for the same actor, Patrick Boyer. 
Um, Patrick made the werewolf costume as well, so he's also an effects artist. Um, so then we had an effects artist by the name of Beatrice Sniper. She did the muscle structure paint on the on the uh, superheroes unlimited suit, so it kind of looked, you know, had that aliens muscle structure on there. Yeah. So she did that. She made the hands as well. So the hands that he's kind of holding up in everybody's face. Wah, 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 wah. Those um, <laughs> Beatrice made those as well. So. Uh, and and then she applied the uh, the the mask to the actor because it came in several pieces, you know, because it's so big. But uh, yeah, just uh, all around phenomenal effects. Mike did. Mike handled the Mike uh, handled the uh, the guts in Endangered. Yeah. Uh, when you see the werewolf disembowel the hunter, that was uh, Mike handled that stuff. And like I said, Patrick is the one that made the werewolf suit. So, and then Beatrice also worked on that film where she did the makeup for Tim O'Hearn, who was the other brother, the, the Wolfman brother. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we had three artists on there, man. This is great people. I love to work with all of them, and we try to get them all involved as often as possible because they're. You can see the work is awesome. It, it is. It is because e uh, with each short story, by abducted and endangered. Man, it's like the effects and just everything you 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 put in a hundred ten percent because I I loved I loved how you stuck with just you know just the classic alien and yeah. the classic wolf that I mean right. werewolf I mean that's right. I mean that's the classics right there the horror I love that man I I well, love that. This was, you know, the goal when we're doing these anthologies is, is like, look, we, we have four different stories to play around with. What did we all, what do we always wanted to do? I've always wanted to do a werewolf um, movie. I've always wanted to do a movie like about a sci-fi about an alien. I've always wanted to do like the, the worms, like those giant bugs or something like that, like Dal uh, Damnation Alley or, you know, any of those classic movies that like, oh, I got to do something with the giant bugs in it. And then the dolls, we wanted to do the dolls, and but I wanted to kind of stay away from the Chuckies and the Annabelles and kind of make involve the doll, but in a different way, which is, I don't want to give it away, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Um, yes. And then with this new anthology, uh, as you guys saw with Suitsay, now we're touching on like time travel, and then we get to do a story, uh, Splinter is a story about like an ancient shaman curse, uh, and then we're doing... Um, the third story we're doing is called Robot, and that's going to be another sci-fi entry in it. Uh, but that's about a little kid that finds a robot at a crash site in the woods um, and brings it home. And then the last story is called Haunted, and that's going to deal with paranormal investigators and kind of the whole world of hauntings and, and you know, investigations. And so it's going to be, um, it's again, we have another round of, of really cool horror-related uh themes that we haven't um, uh, been able to do anything with until now. Now we get to explore those things and, you know, tell those stories. So it's one of the things I really love about the anthology format is that I, I get to look forward, like, because I know the next film is going to be so different from the one that we just finished. or the, You know what I mean? So that's, yeah. it's, it's something really great to look forward to. Yeah, it's, it, it's amazing, man. And just the just bringing it back because i know when i last talked to you when i was on the uh, when i guest co-host with chris carnage on the chris carnage show and i had you and uh, todd on there pretty much with this pandemic production got halted but you said at the time just um doing post-production editing was about mm. where you planned it to be because of with with everything you pretty much you already had it shot but going in doing post production there how how's yeah. how's post production been with the with the new stories on this well you know obviously we've only shot as, to date soothsayer so we haven't shot anything else so the post production for soothsayer um it we we just got soothsayer the second day it was two days of shooting the second day we had just wrapped and then the next week Everything was COVID, and everything was like, oh, we're going to start shutting stuff down. And it was, we would have never been able to shoot in the locations we did had we waited another week. It would have been over. Very lucky to get that in the bag. And so what's funny is that I kind of cut it together, and um, under the assumption, like, originally it was two weeks, right? Two weeks quarantine. So I originally cut it together pretty quickly and came out with a version that I was happy with. And then oddly enough, because of COVID and the lockdown, I kind of started to revisit my cut. 
And, um, you know, interestingly, there were things that I had since corrected, um, music that I added, effects that I perfected, and uh, it actually benefited the film because if I was able to hold a screening or release it and, and COVID had not happened, I probably would have done it with an earlier version of the film that didn't turn out as good as the, the most recent version. So because I got to sit on it for months... I just started looking at it again and going, well, I kind of I don't like the way this looks. I want to tweak this a little bit, or I don't like this. This effect could look better, or you know, um, because it is visually it is heavy with visual effects that it's it's not noticeable because it's not over the top. But there are things that we did that really you know took a lot of time, um, an investment of time into into making happen. So um, yeah, it's um, you know it's it's. It is what it is. I guess that's what it right. is. <laughs> right, right. Got a got a question that's, that's here. Okay, for 2020, and then it is what it is. It is, it is what, what it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> got a question here. Bill Crude around Podcasting Network. He's viewing over on that uh, on that cool. page right there. He he would like to know how would you uh, get. He would like to know how do I get in something like this how how do you he wants to know how do you get in to get to be in a movie how, what what do you have to do to be like i guess just an extra or okay. what? what would what would what would you how would he approach that okay how do you get to be an, an extra in an independent film or maybe he wants to know how do you get to be a filmmaker or how do you start to get into it this is how so, you get. Yeah, that's what I. How you get into independent filmmaking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. General so, question. Yeah. Right. So now there's different types of independent filmmaking. You know, I, I'm I'm more involved in the independent horror community. Um, although my stuff, I'm trying to make myself a little bit more mainstream with that Twilight Zone feel, where I could appeal to, which we have been able to do pretty successfully. Appeal to people that just like good storytelling, and uh, the movies creep them out too. But it's not like it's not because of the brutality or the violence. You know what I mean? It's it's more about the, like you said, the worms <laughs> or something that are, are people's phobias. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's really about if you're if number one, if you're into independent films, then like anything else, you should become involved in it uh, as far as supporting it first, right? right? Going to see independent films, find out who the filmmakers are in your area what projects they're working on. You know, there's a lot of people that always say to me, if you need any help on set, let me know, which is, it's, it's an offer and I, and I truly appreciate it. Um, but it's not, it's not as easy as just inviting a bunch of people to set to do miscellaneous jobs that you usually have a crew already. You're probably not planning on making a film unless you have those pieces in place already. So if people really want to get involved in it, Go to the film festivals, watch some independent films, find out who the filmmakers are, write to them, write to us on our website, say, hey, I'm interested in seeing more. You know, here's where you could purchase some films, support the scene a little bit, kind of see what's going on. If you want to get involved in making a film, I would say not so much to go and start shadowing another filmmaker. It's going to be hard to do stuff like that. I mean, I've welcomed people on my set to do that with me. But, you know, if, if you tell one person to do it, a hundred might reach out to do it. It's really hard to accommodate that. Right. But what you want to do is figure out what, you know, if you want to be a filmmaker, if you want to get involved in it, then start researching what it is to be a gaffer or a boom operator or cinematographer or, you know, whatever it is you think you might like to do on a film set. Now, a lot of people just want to act. And that's cool. And there's a lot of independent filmmakers, myself included, that I put out first and say, hey, we're shooting in Branchville. We're shooting in Jersey City. This date, 6 a.m. We need people in the bar. You want to be there? Show up. And it's, you know, so we put those opportunities out there. Um, but if you want to get involved in, in getting on, on more sets and, and making that more frequent, I just think you have to get involved in the scene. You have to meet yeah. filmmakers. You have to go to the film festivals. Uh, I've cast... I, uh, an un, uncounted number of people I could tell you right now that I have cast in my films um, that I met at film festivals or I met at um, horror conventions that just approached me. Um, I'm 
casting people in the anthology that we're working on now from people that have just reached out to me on Facebook and said I'm an actor and I'm like you know what I got a part for you and I'll send them and they'll do a read for me so it's uh there the opportunities are there but you have to get involved you can't just find out about a movie and say how would it be in this you got to kind of live around it for a while yeah now, you know that, everything everything it's like anything else in life there's a skill set yeah well and you have to learn the skill set yeah before you you're able to apply it to anything. yeah and, and and even like you know when it comes to being an extra you don't have to be a great actor you we could you know just have anybody standing in, in, in the background and but you just kind of want to be there and you kind of want to see what's going on and I understand that I love that like being on sets and and I encourage that but what you have to do is you can't just come out of nowhere and want to do that you kind of want to get to know people that know people that are doing it find out how you can get involved Follow these guys on Facebook. Follow these independent filmmakers. Sign up, subscribe to their website. Kind of get a little bit more involved in the community. Go to some screenings because there's people I talk to at a screening and they're like great people. And I say, friend me on Facebook. And then as soon as an opportunity for an extra arises, I'm like, you know what? Let me reach out to that guy, John. Let me reach out to this girl. And she, she you know, and it's just a matter of putting yourself into the mix. You know, you yeah. got to get yourself in the mix. Just emailing me and go, hey, do you need an extra? It's like okay, you know, I guess I will somewhere, if not right, not right, not right now. And then for me to remember your email and go back to that email at a later date, sometimes it's hard, you know. But um, especially doing when you're doing a project like that, I'm sure there's all kinds of emails getting exchanged and private yeah. messages, yeah. texts, and all that stuff. Yeah, there is. And I'm always listen. I always try to reply to everybody. And um, I'd love to put everybody that wrote me into an independent film, but it's just about timing. People want to be an extra. Sometimes they don't realize that you might have to show up at 6 a.m. and you don't become that extra until 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock at night, and now you're sitting around all day. Just That's the way a shoot goes sometimes. Yeah. So there's a lot involved in it, you know? Right, right. There, there's a lot, a lot of pieces of the puzzle that actually go into it and it just like like you said there that's that's great because it's talking about like extras and casting calls i i have seen where where you've put out put up there on facebook hey i'm looking for so many extras um between and you gave a detail of what extras you're looking for to shoot for a couple hours here or there and right I, i've seen those posts there and i say to myself i'm like man if i lived in jersey i would uh, i'd definitely like just like stand in the background of a film you know it's like hey mom i'm in a movie you know just yeah just we've, we've had some it is, don't yeah. do that though if you're an extra i won't <laughs> hate that. i i actually i was an extra when i was like eight years old in a movie that was being filmed here in uh daytona beach they put it out on the radio station here and said we're looking for extras uh for a group of people we don't care come on out and we went out i forget where it was at there but i stood up front there i made my way up to the front there on the rail and i'm like right there and um i i forget what the hell movie it was and <laughs> I, I guess it I, wasn't a blockbuster huh? yeah it wasn't <laughs> i they gave me a sign and i like held it up and the director got mad because when he went and panned by the crowd i threw it up and someone said the director was like, cut, we got to go right back through. The kid held the sign up. Take that sign away from him. <laughs> what the heck? You know? And then they, they did that, and we just hung around, and then, and then it was like, okay, thank you. And everyone left, and I was like, wow, I got to be an extra in a movie. You know? Awesome. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty much, pretty much it. Bill, that was the highlight, huh? Yeah, yeah. The highlight. <laughs> that was my highlight, man. Bill, yeah. Bill was asking because he's – He's a pro professional uh, wrestler. He was just looking to do something else, and he'd love to learn to act. Um, oh, that would that would be a question. You're right a wrestler. There. You should already know some acting. Do you not sell? <laughs> Bill, Bill, well, I, 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 Phil, the Undertaker, you know, selling son of a bitch. I work with Bill at Knockout Ripper. I know I work with him. Bill can sell and he can act. <laughs> he can, but. Here, here's a here's a question to yes. to put in for for acting, um, acting classes. Do you, do you you recommend acting classes? Taking extra acting classes. Do you recommend that for someone who wants to get into to better the better themselves with acting? 
Well, I, 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 I wouldn't say that they would ever hurt, yeah. you know, um, I would never tell somebody that you cannot act unless you take acting classes, but I would also never discourage someone from taking acting classes because like any, you know, anything that you want to, um, excel at, uh, the more, you know, uh, the better you are at, you know, any given task or career. And so why wouldn't you want to take acting classes and get someone's perspective on what you're doing? And, uh, you know, if that's something that you, that you want to invest in and that's something, and it's a, it's a career that you're serious about. Absolutely. You know, absolutely take acting classes. Hey, 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 was it Bill? Yeah, Bill. Also wrestling. Cause my son, he also was doing wrestling for their, he's concentrating on school now, but he got into acting. The freshman sophomore year, he actually he did the play and everything. And we went and seen it. The play was very dry. It was, <laughs> but but all the kids in it were great that they're acting of it. Mm. Like my whole family was like blown away at Logan the way he acted, and he said, "Well, being from wrestling, going into these acting classes." It's like the whole first act. He's like, I'm a heel. He yeah, said, and then guy. there's a baby face. Said, and then there's a baby face turn. Good guy. So any wrestlers looking to go into acting classes, you'll probably pick it up pretty naturally, because most of them do because they take the they take that stuff they learn from wrestling. A lot of it applies to acting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, You're doing it in front of a live audience. You have a mic, yeah. man. You get if you you want people to believe you're the good guy, you got to go for it. You want to you want the crowd to hate you. You got to be the bad guy. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's that, that. I mean, pretty pretty much there. I I agree. I definitely agree with you. Re with the return of Theater of Terror, you launched an Indiegogo campaign, and I checked it out today and. Wow, All I got to say is you're doing you're doing pretty good, man. It's it's awesome to see the backing you're getting behind the uh, return to theater of terror there. Now, yeah. now with the Indiegogo campaign, how how long do you plan on running that? It's running for two months. Two months. So I think yeah, I think we got about forty five or days left or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So it's or, fairly or more it's maybe. Fairly yeah, it's fairly recent that you put that up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's only been up for about ten or eleven days. So yeah, so we're probably more on forty nine or something like that. Forty eight days, yeah. Okay, yeah, because yeah, you're 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 thirty six percent there. Um, because I just yeah. pulled it up here on my browser here, and that's wow, great. I. I, I love it, Ben. With with how many people you got back in it, and this, I'm I'm excited to see what what the rest of the films once you start getting that going and stuff. Because honestly, when I saw your post on Facebook and you said we're it's going, we're getting it going again, I was like, yes. I was like, screw you, pandemic. I, yeah, like, you can't stop it. The train's going. No, nah, it's coming, man. It's coming. <laughs> I love it. And I, you're right, man. I am. I'm. 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 I'm so happy and flabbergasted and uh, impressed with the the support that we've gotten. Um, you know, it's it's great to know that people um, love what we did with the Theater of Terror and that people have trust in us. You know, to get this kind of stuff done. We've always, you know, we're 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 pretty straight shooters when it comes to what we're making and what we're trying to go for and what we're delivering to the fans and. Uh, to have the kind of support that we've gotten, it's um, it's it's really floored us. We've you know behind the scenes we're talking and saying, man, it's great that so many people have this kind of faith in us, and uh, some of the donations we're receiving are so generous, and um, multiple jo uh, just it, it's just uh, like I said, man, it's 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 shocking. You know, we you go into any campaign like that a fundraiser, and you never know, you know, where you're going to go. For us. We're trying to make our movies bigger and better, and, and unfortunately, that's that's not possible if you don't have the funding. Uh, what's great about doing the anthologies, too, is that we've always had the plan that we're going to try to raise as much as we can, and whatever we raise, we'll make as many of the films as we can in the anthology. We have the stories, we have them cast, you know, so uh, we're not going to let it stop us, but the, the, we're not going to let the budget stop us, but with that said, 
having that budget allows us to to do things that um, we believe the fans really want to see. We we believe that the fans um, are enjoying our stories, our production value, and just the way that we kind of try to bring the community together. We bring a lot of different actors, a lot of different effects artists, and and ev and everybody. Um, onto the same project and that camaraderie, the experience is—it's uh, just great for everybody. We love—we love doing it. It's—it's it's amazing. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's—it's it's amazing here. Let me try to pull it up on the web browser here. I have the web capture. Uh, let's see if I can pull this up because I want to share it. And there we go, right there. Okay, those of you in the live stream, right there. I have the Indiegogo campaign right here on the, you can see, go ahead, sign up and help Tom Ryan out for the return to the theater of terror. I mean, it's, I mean, you get all theaters, all theaters matter, especially the theater of terror. <laughs> <Yes>. especially <laughs> the theater. <laughs> And you get the perks, the perks on the side there. If you if you scroll down the page here and you look at the perks on the side as you're going along reading the information about the Return to Theater Terror there, you get some pretty good perks there. I mean, the more you, uh, do, you put in, the more you get out there. And, I mean, you get... If you click on the perk, too, it gives you a description and fully of... of a few people had that question. I said, just click on it, and it'll break it down. You'll, you'll see the breakdown. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing, man. Because you contribute, you get something back, and when you do contribute, you you are helping out. I mean, it's it's great. I mean, why not? You know, why not get you know something in return? Because I mean, it's you know you pay it forward, and I love that. I I definitely love yeah. that, and I I'm so excited that things are picking back up because it's going to be great i enjoyed the first the first film the theater of terror and i know i'm definitely going to enjoy this one and be creeped out as much <laughs> thanks man yeah i'm going to go watch the first one just so i can make fun of everett and the worms yeah, yeah check it out god yeah and just let everyone know on the description of this episode i put links up for the Indiegogo campaign for Theater of Terror in the description of this episode. Be sure to follow the links there. And also, I put up other links such as the Theater of Terror website and where can people keep up with Theater of Terror on social media there. Uh, yeah, on, on our Facebook page, Theater of Terror, you'll find us. Um, you know, check out our website. We got links to the to the Facebook page. You subscribe on our website. If you go to the contact us tab, you can subscribe and you'll get all the updates on everything that we're working on. You get all the newsletters. Um, but yeah, I just want to say to everybody and, and anybody that has donated or, or might think about it or checking out our campaign that we really do appreciate it. Every dollar goes to making the production um, the best that we could possibly make it. We're trying to bring indie film. Uh, to a level, uh, especially the local level in New Jersey and 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 beyond, to everybody that loves independent film, just let them know that you know it can be done. We got we we have the people that are driven. We have the stories. We have the willpower. And and with the fans and the support, um, we can make some really cool, fun movies here uh, for everybody to enjoy. It's stuff that we love, and uh, that's the dream. And so we appreciate everybody that's that's donated or even taking a look at the the Indiegogo campaign. People that have just shared it. Or sent it out to their followers on Twitter or whatever. That means just as much to us as a donation. It's great to get the word out, and it's great that you believe in us. And thank you. Nice. Anything you want to add uh, before we uh, close out, Ripper? Uh, just great talking to Tom. I love talking to him again. Definitely going to check out more of your stuff. And like I said, it's people like you that's going to take the stigma off of independent. Room. Uh, movies and film stuff like that. The the more you people give, the better hill movies will be. Thus, everybody else has to step up their game. So <laughs> come on. Yes. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Yes, appreciate it. Thomas Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, podcasting network, your top source for independent podcasting. Head over to podcasting.net. Follow them on social media. 
Podcast City Network on Facebook, Twitter at Podcast City Net. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Podcast City Network, and on Twitch, backslash Podcast City Network. Podcast City Network. Be creative, be independent, be yourself. When I need a logo, a graphic design done, I use Three Count Design. Three Count Design offers a wide range of graphic design products, video photography, and other forms of media. Everything from t-shirt designs to websites. For more information, head over to facebook.com slash three count design. That is facebook.com slash three count design. When I want to kick back a few cold ones with my friends, I head over to City Limits Taproom. City Limits Taproom has a wide selection of TVs to watch your favorite sports, indoor and outdoor seating. They are pet friendly. City Limits Taproom also has food made fresh to order and the grilled cheese is excellent. I recommend the grilled cheese and the apple pie cider. The fries on the side, can't go wrong with that, baby. More information for upcoming events, head over to facebook.com slash city limits tap room. Thank you again, Thomas Ryan, for coming on the program and discussing the theater terror and the return of the theater terror, which I cannot wait to come out. I'm excited about it. And you can follow more of the Theater Terror with the links in the description of this episode. So please follow and support Thomas Ryan in the Theater of Terror and the Indiegogo campaign for the return of the Theater of Terror. It's going to be great. That's pretty much it. As always, too, I want to thank Ripper Blackheart for joining me on ELS Uncut. Every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. on the Everett Lee Show Facebook page and on Podcast City Network's Facebook page. And that is it. We'll see you again next week for another new episode of the Everett Lee Show. 